we have this conversation in this country all the time. If Labour are in, the reason the NHS is broken is because Labour's broken it. If the Conservatives are in, it's because the, cons the Tory, Tory cuts or whatever. The, no one seems to understand that like all of these problems are eternal. They're going to go on forever. They're not solvable. No one's going to solve the NHS. No one's going to solve climate change. No one's going to solve anything. What we can do is tinker at the edges and improve certain aspects of it at the cost of others at the cost of others. My conversation today is with Constantine Kissen. I'm looking forward to it enormously. Uh, this will be the third time we've talked and I've come to regard him as a good friend and a very spirited and insightful man who grew up in Russia and is now in Britain. He's recently written a book, An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, which I thoroughly recommend. It's a powerful reminder of why we should not take the good things we have for granted. He's also co-host of the very popular social commentary podcast, Trigonometry, which I know has many viewers in my own home country, as well as here in Britain. So Constantine, Thank you so much for your time. It's great to see you again. It's good to see you, John. Thanks for making it back over here. And since we last talked, uh, you've become a dad. I Nikolai. Have. Nikolai's my son, yeah. Just after we were together last time. How has that experience uh, affected your view of the world? Well, first of all, it's awesome. It's just awesome. It's, a gr I, I, it's, it's great. It's the best thing ever. Um, it's hard as well. Uh, I we just we've just come back from a uh, three week visit to America, and it was ironic e that even with all the jet lag and the traveling and all the rest of it, I haven't slept that well for eleven months now as I did on the trip. So uh, not getting a lot of sleep, but I love it. Uh, has it changed me? Yeah, I think it's it's softened me a little bit. Actually, it's taken some of the edges off. It's made me aware that it's really, really important to try and communicate what I'm trying to communicate in a way that makes it easier for other people to hear. Because I think before I felt that, you know, the most important thing is to get my opinion out in a way that draws attention, let's say. Whereas now I really feel it's about persuading people. And part of it is when you see a baby, you kind of realize that all human beings were that thing once and they've been shaped and morphed into different things by the experiences that they have. But they were all that pure innocence one. So it's made it easier for me to connect with people as human beings, I think. Does he have a sense of humor? Uh, yes. Oh. He's learned to play peekaboo. So he sticks his face in the corner of the sofa and waits for, for him or uh, for me or my wife to say, where's Nikolai? And then he's like, you know, he does that. So he, he's got a very cheeky sense of humor, yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's terrific. Tell me, um, uh, it won't be long, he'll get a bit older, and he'll notice his friends are uh, using social media, mm. and he's going to want to use it too. How are you going to handle that? What will your attitude be? The idealistic version of me says he's not getting a smartphone until at least 16. Oh, good luck with that. Which is what everyone says. So we, I guess what the truth is we'll find out. Um, but we, we just had you on trigonometry, and this is one of the things we talked about, the impact social media is having on us. I genuinely think this isn't a mission for me, but anyone who invents a smartphone that allows children to use certain apps and not others um, is going to make a killing because there's going to be a huge demand from parents for a way that their children are able to still be connected to the world because that's important. You know, we've got a uh, a guy that works for us who's 17 years old and he's incredible at understanding social media and YouTube and so on. So you don't want to cut your children off from this new technology and being able to use it for, for work and for their lives. It's going to be essential. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's so much darkness and misery and uh, addiction, frankly, that comes with with being on a phone, particularly when your brain is not fully formed, that is definitely something that we have to protect our children against as well. So I guess we'll find out is, is the truth. I think it's pretty tough being a parent now, frankly. Yeah. And maybe it's tough being a kid too. Tell me something. Have you noticed that he tends to look to mum for some things and dad for others? I had four children. They're all adults now. Three of, you know, two of them have got children of their own. 
But I noticed at a very early age, they'd go to mum for warmth and nurture. And I was the one that was meant to be the entertainment act. And uh, excitement and a bit of roughhousing came from dad. Yeah, that's well, that, I don't know if that's what he goes to me for, but that's what he gets. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, I chuck him in the air and, you know, do all sorts of stuff with him like that. Uh, I, think, I, think, uh, I think it's also about what men and women tend to naturally lean towards. I th when I look at my wife, sort of as I'm throwing him in the air, I can see, particularly for the first few months, she was not particularly comfortable with that. It's like, a, you know, they're very much in caring and nurturing and protection mode. Whereas as a, as a dad, you're much more likely to go the other way. So that's, what, that's why you have both. Both, I think, are important, aren't they? Oh, 100%. 100%. The play and the stimulation. Yeah. The boundary stretching, the warmth and the nurture. Absolutely. It does matter. Mm -hmm. um, you recently said, though, uh, moving on, that, and I'm quoting, one of the biggest unspoken truths of modern Western society is that women have been brainwashed into acting in ways that are fundamentally against their own long-term happiness and well-being in order to maintain the myth that men and women are the same. Uh, uh, You'll be surprised that got quite a lot of, uh, a lot of hostile attention online. Did it? Yeah, it got a lot of very positive attention as well. I'm, I'm only joking, of course. But yeah, uh, but we all know that. It, 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 I'm not saying anything that people don't know. And it was sparked by a conversation I had with somebody. Look, there are different ways to slice that particular statement. I, I probably regret using the word brainwashed just because it made it harder for people to hear what I was saying, even people who agree with me generally. Uh, but if you look at what dating on social media or, or dating on apps has done to the way that men and women connect and have sex and all of these things, women are increasingly now encouraged to have sex in the way that we think of men being naturally more leaning towards, which is transactional, you know, one night stands, not, no attachment. And the fact is, I mean, it doesn't actually make men happy either, but it really doesn't make women happy if you talk to women uh, about it. And we've had a number of guests on the show, particularly Louise Perry and Mary Harrington, both of whom I really think you'd, you'd have a great conversation with, talking about many of these things. Uh, but also what really sparked that was a couple of conversations I had with women. And one of them was I was, uh, after my Oxford Union speech, which I'm sure you'll ask me about, I was invited to do a number of things, and one of them was Unheard, our good friends at Unheard. They hosted an evening that I was a part of, and, some, and Freddie, who hosts that, that, that show, he asked me, he said, there's something different about you since you, since you, you had a son. Something, there's something going on. And I said, the future is no longer an abstraction. It has a face and it has a name. And we talked about that and how my view of the world has changed, and you know, that, that's genuinely what I think. And then I, I was standing outside and I, I, I bummed a cigarette off Freddie and we were standing out there being very naughty and smoking. And this couple came out and the, the woman came over to me. She said, thank you so much for that. I, I really, you know, it's really changed the way I think about things, particularly about children. I, I never thought about children, never thought that's what I wanted. But, but this is what I want now. And I said, how old are you? And she said, 43. Wow. And I hope to God that they're able to, to have a child and, and get what they want. But the truth is, that's unlikely. There are many, many people who are in that position in our world um, who've been, look, I said brainwashed, maybe it was the wrong word, but who've been encouraged to forget about the things that actually matter. I'm not saying every woman should have a child. I'm not saying any should. There are no shoulds in what I'm saying. And actually, I think that's one of the places people often have gone wrong and one of the reasons people resist traditional values quote unquote is that they've been imposed with a sort of iron will instead of being told that you know what do you want in life well you want meaning and fulfillment that's what everybody wants what is the path to that for you for most people not for everybody but for most people that is going to involve family and children and so that was the first conversation. And then I just, you know, I have so many conversations with women who, who don't want to say this in public because it's uncomfortable and you get attacked and whatever, who say, look, I, you know, I, I was obsessed with my career the whole time. And then I had a child and it literally changes your brain. It literally changes you. And it does. And I, I think we've got to start talking about it. You know, as well as I do, 
we are demographically speaking in a really dark place and if we continue down this path it's not going to end well but more important you know we can't ask people to have children for the sake of you know the nation that's not going to happen but what we can do is say to people what do you actually want what that meaning that you crave, that every human being craves, that purpose, that fulfillment, you know, human beings have known for millennia where that comes from. And I don't know that, you know, this existence that we live in now is necessarily given a lot of people that. I mean, we talk about a mental health crisis. Well, the answer to mental health is quite often meaning and purpose. And for some people that is going to be work, for some people that's going to be the contribution they make to others. For a lot of people, it's going to be their own family. You're really alluding there to uh, what some people are now starting to call the depopulation bomb. Because mm. we've had decades since the Club of Rome, was saying, well, earlier Malthus in this country, mm. saying the world can't support uh, this population. We've got to cut it back. Uh, and, and not many people have really realised that outside of Africa, some parts of the Middle East, that's what's happening. Uh, you know, now you've actually got a depopulation bomb, China leading the way. It won't be long. The maths are fascinating on this. Before it will be unusual for somebody to have siblings and aunts and uncles. And so that most basic of family communities is contracting. And I suspect we're starting to see the beginnings of another pandemic, a pandemic of loneliness. Mm. Well, we're in one already. Uh, this atomized society that we live in... Um, and, you know, it's not just about culture. There's an economic dimension to it uh, as well, which is how hard it is for young people to pair up and get together. It's not by any means the only reason, um, but that's also part of it. But, yeah, I mean, look, the, a bunch of atomized individuals on their cell phones, uh, you know, on the Internet, on social media, that's not a recipe for a happy society. And so the downstream impacts of, of that way of being are going to be tremendous and I mean, they're not going to be good. They're not going to be good. I think that's clear. Um, so let, let's trace that through. Firstly, the impact of social media on the way we date now, you've touched on that. There's a bit of research around showing, actually, that it's disastrous. You've got a narrow group of men who are very attractive via social media dating apps, much more attractive than they might be if you met them at the pub or you know, um, in the park the way you might have once. Uh, and they get all the attention, and that's not good for them. And then they will cruelly just dump somebody in the ways you can with social media when they're bored. So it's not working for women either. Mm -hmm. What impact does that sort of social media role now in people meeting and forming relationships? Well, they're not forming relationships, a lot of them. And you say dump cruelly. Actually, a lot of them don't need to because, uh, the, you know, this idea that um, those men, that very top strand of men, uh, They'll quite openly be saying to, to women now, oh, I want an open relationship. You know, I don't want to commit. And women are in a position where because they want a guy who is, you know, attractive and successful and high status and, you know, financially secure and all of that, they will hope that they are the one girl that can convince this guy to settle down with her. But he's got no incentive to do that. Uh, and the impact on that is bad for both men and women, by the way, because um, this isn't good for men. This no. isn't good for men no. uh, in many different ways. For a start, men actually also feel the same disgust after a one-night stand that women do, um, most men. Uh, but also on top of that, uh, it's not good for men because uh, the, the, a stable, as you well know, a stable relationship is something that makes you 10 times the man that you are. That's certainly been my experience. You and I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for my wife. I wouldn't be half the man I am if it wasn't for my wife. And that's because... We built a life together in which she had a massive stake in my success and I had a massive stake in her success. Uh, a series of transactional relationships isn't going to do that for you. It also strikes me that for the boys and girls, if I can put it this way, who are not terribly appealing via social media, if that makes sense. So if you meet someone in the pub, you get the full sort of feel for their relationships. So maybe there's somebody who doesn't look particularly interesting on social media. But when you meet them, there's a great sense of humour, there's chemistry, there's warmth. It's a very different thing. And they potentially can miss out good, decent, honest people who are looking for a respectful and meaningful relationship, missing out altogether. And maybe that's partly why we now got this extraordinary thing. 
right across the West with men on their own, not forming relationships, living at home late into their lives with their own parents. And on top of that, we have a whole series of things that give men an opportunity to experience the illusion of success without actually having to work for it. Uh, I'm someone who's who spent a lot of my childhood playing video games, and I, I haven't, I'm not someone who thinks video games is the root of all evil or whatever. What they do is they give you a fake sense of accomplishment. And if, it's, if you're not properly socialized, if you don't spend time around other people, if you're stuck in that world, it can give you the sense that you're doing well that doesn't match up to act how other, other people actually perceive you as well. So um, we've, we, there are a lot of problems with all of that. So back on the loneliness and the family formation side of it, one of the economic problems that, in my view, is arising out of, there's no other way of putting it, the economic mismanagement uh, of most Western economies over the last 15 years is that young people can't get a start on the economic ladder. They can't get into a house. That has two obvious, amongst many other implications. It delays family formation, relationship and family formation. And it also means that those young people don't have an investment in our culture. And there's some early emerging evidence now that that's, you know, the old saying that if you're not a socialist at 18, you've got no heart if you're still a socialist at 30, you've got no brains. But if anything, now through their 20s and 30s, they're drifting further to the left because they don't feel invested in the system. This isn't sounding like a terribly happy story. No, it's not. And, you know, this is a particular problem here in the UK uh, where people are locked out of the opportunity to live in a home that they can call their own. And of course, that's going to, you know, and we see that the average age of a house purchase, I think, is mid 30s onwards. First time you, you buy your own place. Um, and there are, of course, a lot of people who don't buy their own place. They're stuck renting probably now forever because they're just never going to catch up. Uh, the average age of having the first child for a woman is going up at the same time. Um, you know, I'm a good example. My wife and I had our first first son at first child at 39, and it's part, for, for many of the same reasons. For many of the same reasons, uh, because uh, you know, it was only when we had our own place, and it took my wife a few years to settle down and to feel comfortable. Then that conversation opened up. I think if we'd if we'd done that earlier, we would have had children earlier and we would have had more children. Like now that I've had the first, I'd happily bang out five or six or whatever. Not going to happen in our case, but but that's kind of how I feel about it. So, yeah, it's, it's a big, big problem. And uh, what people don't seem to understand is, is that, you know, the reason this issue isn't getting solved is like uh, the fact that we endlessly print money to indebt our children and grandchildren, the reason the housing problem isn't getting solved in this country is that too many middle class people who are already on the housing ladder, who are invested in the price of housing always going up. And they will refuse and punish any politician uh, who offers to solve the housing problem. Part of solving it is reducing the price of housing. There's no way around that. Yeah, it is a real social and political and economic problem in my view. Uh, no getting away from that at all. We also know that vast numbers of people in the West will say my only chance of ever having a home, a roof over my head, is through inheritance. Mm. And I think that sets up unhelpful family dynamics as well. It does. And also uh, the parents are dying later now. So you might be in your 50s or 60s uh, by the time that happens. Do we want a you know generation of people who are still sort of children because you you know that you're not fully an adult until i think until you you have something that you are responsible for really and your house your family those are things that really force you to mature quickly generation of people in their 50s who've never had that i don't think that's a recipe for a good society so you've written a book you know a love letter to the west you enjoy your life here as the same time that I must say you make a great contribution to the community. Um, but can I ask you, you've seen the alternative because you grew up in Russia. We'll come back to this later in terms of what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine later, but, but in the short term, you've got a particularly clear vision of all of this because 
you had difficulties imposed from on top of you, like what we're doing in the West, we're doing to ourselves. It doesn't have to be like this. Mm. Must strike you as a great irony. It is. It is. I, I think I always try to caution people. I think those of us who are frustrated with many of the things that are happening in the West can sometimes you know, overdo the comparison with the Soviet Union in which I grew up in. I, I, I think it's important to have a sense of perspective. The reason I talk about some of the issues that we've got going on is that they, they need to be addressed. Uh, but we are still the freest, most prosperous, most comfortable, most stable, most safe, secure societies in the world. And my worry is, as I know your worry is, that if we don't appreciate that and don't celebrate that, we can throw it away. Um, and that's really why we're talking about these young people who are locked out of housing and so on. If you don't have a stake on your society, why would you appreciate it? Why would you celebrate it? Why would you defend it? You know, uh, that's really the, the, the thing that I think we should focus on. So, of course, it's important, and this is what I try to do, is to remind people not to throw away the baby with the bathwater when it comes to criticizing our societies. But of course, we have a lot to do as well. Understood. Now, since we last spoke, mm. you have exploded everywhere, including Thanks Australia. Thanks to you, you, of course. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> but you, know, you put together some very, very convincing words in an Oxford debating uh, union uh, performance. Uh, and um, what you said about wokeness, what, January this year, is quite recent, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I understand it's been viewed over a hundred million times online and maybe a lot more. We don't really know. Why do you think what you said had such an incredible impact? Because you did it quite sympathetically, actually. You were careful in the way that you assertively attract, uh, attacked a comment, but you did it with some sensitivity. I think that's why. I think that's one of the reasons why. Uh, I think another of the reasons why is that we live in a society in which adults are afraid of children. And so when you see someone who's speaking to young people in the, on their turf at a college, at a university, um, and who's prepared to speak truth to them, but to do it in a way that's got a bit of humor, a bit of levity, that tries to meet them where they're at and says, look, I know this is what you think. Here are some things you probably haven't thought about. Um, I think that's quite appealing to people because, as I say, we live in a society where we're fearful uh, of telling young people what we think and what perhaps they need to hear. Uh, so I think that's another of the reasons. And the third reason is I tackle very directly uh, the doomsday narrative about climate change and net zero. Uh, and I explain to people the reality of that issue and how that isn't, isn't going to be addressed. Uh, so uh, the fact that no one has ever told these people in the UK who glue themselves to roads and throw soup on paintings and whatever that this country is responsible, produces 1% of global emissions and is responsible for another 1%, so 2%. You know, the idea of killing pensioners every winter with fuel poverty doesn't seem as appealing if you recognize that it has absolutely no impact on global warming whatsoever. Um, so I think it's the combination of all of those three. And, you know, hopefully, uh, if I say so myself, someone trying to use logic, we don't have a lot of that going on lately. And I also think that, as you say, the sensitivity to other people and to, you know, trying to exp find a way to connect not to point, point the finger and say, you're stupid, you're woke, you're this, you're that, but to say, look, here are some things, here are some rational arguments about where you may want to modify your thinking. Um, I think that's why, and actually, one of the most gratifying things that has happened since is I've had a lot of contact with a lot of people who anyone watching this conversation would be shocked that are even prepared to speak to me. Um, People reach out to me and go, you know what, I can see that you're trying to win people over. Let's talk. Uh, from a lot of people who, 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 who a lot of people sort of on our side, if you like, if there is such a thing, would consider like the enemy. I think that's the thing that I'm really, really keen to get past is we've got ourselves locked into, you know, they call it the culture war. And once you start calling something a war, it's very difficult to see the humanity of people on the other side. Um, 
I always try and make this point. I don't know about you, maybe, maybe this isn't true for you, but I know that when I was 20 years old, I was stupid and arrogant and thought I knew everything and I had the solutions to everything. And I was Well, you only thought it. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> you knew, right. Yeah. Well, then that's kind of how it is, yeah. right? So we got to remember that, you know, young people are like that uh, and some of them are persuadable. Some of them, not all of them, of course, but some of them are. Let's try and persuade them. It does tell you something about the way in which we now educate, raise and educate our young people um, that, in a sense, what you did was to put up an alternative moral proposition as well, as I saw it. You know, you, you're really saying, well, if you pursue policies single-mindedly thinking the only thing challenged before us is climate change and we've got to turn ourselves inside out. Well, what happens if that results in people in the rest of the world starving? Because it can. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a moral dimension as well. But it's also a practical one, isn't it? Because they won't care about the environment. That's one aspect of it. So there's a, there are alternative moral perspectives for young people who are idealistic and care about moral issues. But then there's a very hard-nosed practical one. If you really want to ensure that climate change policy is demolished, break down the liberal global order mm -hmm. and allow the autocrats what they want, which is domination of global politics. That's right. And I think... The you know a bit about that from... Well, I mean, if the Russians and the... No, no, I don't say the Russian people and the Chinese people, but their the people regimes, who run those countries, the people yeah. who run those countries, if they have say... Well, you're not going to advance arguments about climate change very effectively. Mm -hmm. And that is at stake now because they are plainly seeing us as degenerate, as lost, as ineffective, divided, ill-disciplined. And they're right. We are all those things. We should be aware that we are all those things. And the reason that I've been speaking about this and the reason you speak about this is that that is the path that we're sliding down that slope. And either we stop it uh, all, all those things that people care about uh, are, are going to go in, in, in the dustbin of history along with our civilization. So I think that's why it's important. But in terms of the, the moral frameworks and all of that, I think it's really much simpler than that in some ways. The, the, the single line that has made the greatest impact to my understanding of the world is, is from Thomas Sowell, who to me is one of the greatest modern thinkers. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. You're not going to solve climate change. You're not going to solve anything. You can make adjustments, and you know this much better than I do from being in government. Every policy has a trade-off. And very often, not ever, I think always actually, the reason that issues become difficult and controversial is precisely because the trade-offs are as bad as the solution quite often. And you have to pick very carefully how exactly you calibrate your solution to avoid causing a lot more damage than you're trying to prevent. Uh, and we've completely lost the ability to see that nuance. Uh, everything now is seen as, you know, we have this conversation in this country all the time. If Labour are in, the reason the NHS is broken is because Labour's broken it. If the Conservatives are in, it's because the, the Tory, Tory cuts or whatever. The, no one seems to understand that, like, all of these problems are eternal. They're going to go on forever. They're not solvable. No one's going to solve the NHS. No one's going to solve climate change. No one's going to solve anything. What we can do is tinker at the edges and improve certain aspects of it at the cost of others. At the cost of others. Uh, this was exactly, and you and I talked about this last time, what happened over COVID. People forgot that safety has trade-offs, that freedom has trade-offs. This is what no one wants to say. No one wants to say, yes, Freedom of speech has the consequence that some guy is going to be insulting to someone else online and someone might get upset. But that is a price we're willing to pay because we want to live in a free society. Yes, not locking down the country may, may, we don't know, may have caused more people to die. But locking down the country also caused more people to die. So which one of those do we want? How do we calibrate that policy? We've completely lost the ability to have those conversations, which is why I think it's really important that we, we try to bring that idea back. There are no solutions. They just aren't. You know this. Am I wrong about this, John? As a no, former? you're absolutely right. Yeah. And the other great problem, though, is that a good government reflecting a good society recognises 
not just that there's no absolute answer to anything, but that you actually have to be able to manage many difficult issues at any given time. You and I have to do that in our own personal lives. And so do governments. And so what we're reducing politics to is sort of a, a, a series of one-trick pony shows where there's a crisis here and that's the only thing we'll talk about. It's not just that there are trade-offs. We're ignoring a whole lot of other problems, which will swamp that one if we don't pay them attention as well. That's right. And I think that's a great tragedy. But you talk about how we communicate. After that, as I understand it, um, uh, you got a lot of opportunity to communicate. Um, my guess is it was overwhelmingly on conservative shows because others don't want to engage. Did that prove to be a bit of a problem? Uh, well, look, it is what it is. I, I'm, I'm kind of used to it now. I'd like to break out of it because I feel like what I'm saying isn't, you know, as you know, I'm not conservative. I certainly have some conservative views. I have some not conservative views. Um, that it's frustrating to me because I'm, I'm, I, I try to s just express my opinion. But it is what it is. Uh, the only left-wing publication uh, that did interview me about it uh, was a guy who came in here and then um, lied about me repeatedly to the point that they had to take whole chunks out of his article out afterwards. That was the only left-winger that ever... Well, he, I don't even know he's left-wing. He writes for a left-wing publication. And, and everybody else was somewhere in the centre or right-leaning. Uh, and that's because they're afraid. Uh, it's because they're afraid of, of what will happen if, if they quote-unquote platform someone who who said the things that I said um, it's a sad state of affairs but that's what it is can I ask you 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 came from a country where there must have been a lot of fear mm. because Russia was autocratic for so long and people's lives were closely surveilled and you could get into a lot of trouble for saying the wrong thing it seems to me that we're becoming surprisingly bound up by fear in our culture now as well yeah, and it, it's very frustrating for me because, you know, people say to me, oh, you're so brave. And I'm like, what are you talking about? W what are you talking about? What is brave about expressing your opinion in public? I, I don't get it. I don't understand why people are so afraid. Uh, and look, it's easy for me to say because the truth of it is that, you know, when Francis and I started trigonometry, for example, we didn't have a huge amount to lose. We were two comedians operating on the British comedy circuit. You know, th th there was not a huge amount for us to lose, even though if it may have felt like it. There are other people who, you know, J.K. Rowling, for example, is a good example of somebody who had a lot potentially to lose in terms of, you know, she's not going to lose her wealth or status or whatever, but uh, you're going to end up, you know, getting a bunch of death threats and hate, hate stuff and whatever that, that, that's unpleasant. But... I just, I just think we, we give way too much importance to other people's words and opinions. We've got to a point where people are fearful of a Twitter backlash. Well, turn your phone off. You know, it's not real. That stuff isn't real. Uh, you know, uh, people sometimes, think, sometimes people will introduce me as controversial. Do you know what? In my entire life, not one person, not one, has ever come up to me on the street other than to say, well done, congratulations, keep going. Now, that's a really interesting point because there's that disconnect, isn't there? You know, Completely. They, you, 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 they try to box you in with the idea that there'll be fearful consequences. But you and Francis, we've been talking about this, you now find friendly people everywhere totally. coming up to you and wanting to engage you. Totally, totally. And uh, this, this fear of being dragged on social media or whatever, I just think people are... I'm sorry for saying this. You're a stuffy old conservative, John, but people need to strap oh, on a pair. Oh, thank you very much. They, they need to strap on a pair. They really do. <laughs> they really, really do. It's not as scary as you think. It's not as dangerous as you think. Now, look, I understand people, some people work in, in, in institutions and organizations where if they do say something, they're going to lose their job. But, but that in itself is horrendous. It is. It is. It is. And that's why... Woke corporates... It's, it, it's not good. It's no. not good. No, it's not. They were once leaders in defending our values. Mm. So often now they're pursuing values that turn out to be very narrow and inappropriate. Comes back to the point that I made earlier about being a society, us being a society in which adults are afraid of children, because that's really what's happening. Uh, it's the 50, 60-something white, straight male CEOs who are afraid of 
either their grandchildren or their kids at home, uh, or the, the, the people at the lower rungs of their own organizations. And frankly, I understand it because we, we, you know, with trigonometry, we now employ people and, you know, the people we employ are great. But nonetheless, you know, the, the, some of the things that young people now expect to have input on from a fairly low level position within the organization, I find that like if, if I had the cheek to, to, to try and sort of get involved in that stuff at their age, like that, I wouldn't have had a, a very easy career. Let's put it that way. Like we 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 tolerate a lot now from young people, uh, and I think that's part of it as well. People are, are scared of their own employees, which I, I you know I don't think that's the way it should be. I think pe people need to show a bit of metal. And, and on that, I understand there was a very interesting conversation between a BBC journalist uh, and Elon Musk uh -huh. here recently. Yeah, uh, and the journalist said that Twitter had a hate speech problem, but when he was challenged by Musk, couldn't name a, simple, a single example. And this seems to me to strike at this very problem now where people will put up a, a feelings-based, prejudice-based perspective and not worry about whether it's backed by the evidence. And on top of that, this is particularly true in journalism where I think there's more than just that going on, if I'm honest. I think what you have is journalists increasingly are now playing to the crowd of other journalists. They have stopped trying to seek the truth, to cover the issues fairly. What they're trying to do is make sure that other journalists see them having asked the right questions. Uh, and so if you're interviewing Elon Musk and you are the tech editor of the BBC, you have to be seen to challenge him because in the BBC's conception, Elon Musk is this evil right wing billionaire who's ruined Twitter. Uh, and so you have to ask that question. Um, and the other thing is, it shows you how terrible they have become at their jobs. How do you know the, the worst thing about that interview isn't even what you've just raised. What happened was the guy ran out of questions ran out of questions. How do you run out of questions when you interview interviewing the guy who says that he wants to preserve humanity by extending it over several planets? How do you run out of questions when you're interviewing a guy who has built one of the most successful breakthrough innovative companies in the world in Tesla? How do you run out of questions when you're interviewing a guy who spent a huge fortune and overpaid in order to buy Twitter because he believes that changing the way our conversations are being had is essential to changing the, the way our society is going. How do you run out of questions? How, how is that possible? How, how, that, that, that is a dereliction of duty. You know, when we were in America just now, I was on Bill Maher's show along with Elon Musk. And Bill Maher is a seasoned interviewer. He's, a, he's had his show on, on HBO and elsewhere for ages. And, you know, I hope he doesn't mind sharing, me sharing this, but he was so excited about having Elon on. And he had Elon on for about 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And he was like a kid in a candy shop, as they'd say in America. How do you run out of questions? How? And it, it only means that you, you just fundamentally are not good at your job. Uh, it brings to mind something that Richard Dawkins said. He was distressed, expressed dismay at the lack of curiosity amongst young people and made the comment that it's only these pesky Christians amongst young people that seem to have any great interest in exploring ideas. Hmm. Have we lost our curiosity? I think some people have. You and I still have it, I think. And the fact that people listen to your show and to mine, I think that shows that a lot of people still have it. Um, you know, look, no one can measure any of these things, really. You know, no. I, I, I could sit here and make a very strong argument for how our society has lost its curiosity. I can sit here and make a very good argument for why it hasn't. It, it's, it's the glass half full, half empty thing. I think for me, and we, we talked about it over lunch, actually, you know, we were talking about whether we can win this, if you like, whatever this is or not. And you said to me, and I thought about it, and I was like, I don't know. What I do know is what my purpose is and what my mission is. Um, as long as there are people who are curious, I'm going to try and feed them. Uh, and if, if, and if, if other people see that and get drawn into it, fantastic. Uh, that, that's all really we can do. Yeah, you know? well, I think we were reinforcing one another's prejudices, mm. as I was saying, <laughs> as it there, because uh, I agree with that. And I think it's really important. Um, but you touched on America. 
Um, how do you feel about America? Uh, what are your key observations about the future of the so-called culture wars there? Because it seems like a nation divided from top to bottom, although maybe the upside of that is, uh, without wanting to preempt your views, is that at least they're engaged in a full-throttled exchange of ideas, whereas I sometimes think in other Western countries, the battle's over. It's interesting. I think there's truth to that. I also think there's truth to the argument that they're not actually engaged in the battle of ideas now. It, it right. feels like it's not ideas that are being lobbed over the barricades anymore. It, 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 it's, there's a kinetic element starting to come through there, which, um, you know, we were in D.C. and you see people. It was interesting. Our team actually um, were out and about and they were filming stuff and they went to a protest about trans rights. And there were a lot of people shouting and our guys, you can't tell which side of the argument they're on. They went over to one of the people who was most profoundly present, let's say, shouting and whatever. And they said, can you tell us what this is about? What it, what it? And he said, no. So how, if you're protesting for something, why wouldn't you want to persuade a single person what you actually believe in? It, it's become very kind of so tribal and so, you know, here's my placard and here's your placard, that it doesn't feel like there's a lot of battle of ideas going on as so much battle of power. Um, but I wrote a piece on my Substack, uh, actually on the plane back. I couldn't sleep, so I just typed it out on my phone, which is called the, the American Anti-Woke Coalition. And I talk about the split between the conservatives uh, and the old school liberals about some of these issues. And it's a very interesting dynamic because I think that the, the path to... Uh, addressing many of these progressive, radical progressive ideas lies through uniting conservatives and the old school liberals around the things that they all agree on. The problem is, you know, the, the conservatives in America, you know, America is a very radical country. It's a very radical country. When we spoke to Ben Shapiro, actually, he made this point, and I think he's absolutely right. People there are pretty, you know, pretty intense about what they believe, and so it makes them difficult, makes it difficult for them to work with others where there's disagreement, you know. And the, the trans debate, for example, is a very good example of this, where the conservatives, many conservatives, have taken the position that I think alienates a lot of people, which is, you know, the libs are transing the kids, and everything else follows from that. And a lot of the old school liberals who also are, are concerned about gender ideology in schools, the transitioning of children, the medicalization of children, all of this stuff, they're quite uncomfortable with some of that rhetoric. And so what you see is a rather precarious temporary alliance that's not really as strong as it could be and, and some of the fissures that come from that. Um, but um, America is a beautiful place. Uh, it's a beautiful place, I think, I am really inspired by um, the mindset there. You know, the, the, there is no tall poppy syndrome in America. You know, if you say to somebody in Britain, you know, I want to build a great business or I want to create a massive YouTube channel or I want to be, you know, hugely successful in this or that, there's a sort of like, who do you think you are kind of look that you get. In America, it isn't like that at all. It's like, great, go for it. What can I do for you? How can we work together? And that's inspiring. You know, that is, this, for someone like me who always wanted to do great things and build things and employ people and create opportunities for others and make an impact in the world, it's, it's fascinating. It also has a shadow, as anything does. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. Uh, but it's, it's a wonderful place in many ways. I, I really, when I'm in America, I am, it gives me like fuel for the rocket in, in a way that no other country I've ever been to does. You've... Um... You've rightly said, I think, that uh, those who are not progressive, in inverted commas, the term that uh, progressives like to use about themselves, they need to positively stand for something. And we've been talking about this as well. Sometimes you get the impression that people are just interested in fighting a battle to win some points rather than build towards a more coherent society where there are greater opportunities for freedom and human flourishing. Um, and so I wonder in that context whether appeals to preserve free speech and to talk about freedom and liberty and so forth are enough. No, no, no. Freedom of speech, I've always said this, freedom of speech is a defensive value. It's a defensive value. It's like, please can I have a fair playing field for my ideas? 
That's what that is, right? Which so is when, not unimportant. You're not saying it's unimportant. Oh, it's incredibly important, yeah. but but it, it's not something you can really unite around. Yeah. Because once you've got free speech, what? If, okay, cool. Now we have a level playing field for ideas. What ideas do you believe in? And that's where everyone falls out, right? So uh, what we have to start thinking about is what is the positive vision of the future that we're offering people? You've talked many times about why hope is so important, right? The, let's say all of us who believe free speech is important achieve our objective. Yeah. Where's the hope in that? Where's the hope? That in and of itself just means we can now have a conversation or at least we're now allowed to speak. Now what? What is it that you want to say? That's the question I'm increasingly asking of people. What is it that you want to say? And I think this is where people start to have, have to start thinking about what is it that we're offering people? Why should you be one of us? Other than the fact that you're not allowed to say what you want at work or at school or whatever. Okay, cool, we get that. But once you are allowed to, what is it that you want? What is it that you believe in? And uh, there has to be, a, I think, a sense of trying to work out what that is. Now, for me, uh, I can chart one or two things that I think are going to be part of that. Uh, the most important one, and Jordan Peterson and I talked about this when he had me on his show, I think it has to be, first and foremost, it has to be invitational. It has to be, we have to tempt people into, we have to say to them, what is it that you want? Okay, well, really deep down, we've talked about this already, you want meaning and fulfillment. What are the things that are going to give you that? Okay, now let's look at that. And then the answers come because part of it, we talked about it already. For many people, that's going to be family. For a lot of people, even before you get there, is it, it's going to, you know, you have to talk about things like mental resilience. Is it good for you to think that you're a victim? Even if you are, let's say you are a victim. Let's say you are a victim of life. You've experienced difficult things and you and I both have. And so is everybody else, by the way, right? Is it good for you? That's a really important point. We love to say I'm a victim, but you've, you've had it easy. And it's often simply not true, is it's it? It's not true. It's not true. The vast majority of people you meet are actually, if you talk to them and you listen to them, you'll find out that everybody's experienced some things that were really difficult for them. And by the way, for some people growing up in a really wealthy, privileged environment with parents who didn't care about them, which often happens, is just as traumatic as growing up in poverty. People don't want to admit that, but that is true, right? Most people have experienced some kind of trauma or difficulty or challenge. Um, now, what is the right approach if you want meaning and fulfillment and purpose and happiness? I don't believe being a victim is that, especially if you're a victim, especially if you've had a hard life. This is why I'm so frustrated with this ideology because the worst thing you can teach people who are victims of life is to wallow in their victimhood. We, we have to give people a path to resilience. And part of the path to resilience is telling them that that's the destination you want to get to. You want to get to resilience. Everybody should be trying to get there. Um, so family, resilience. And then you have to you know, discuss the, the, the point that you and I have talked about almost endlessly, which is which are the societies in the world that actually offer you an opportunity to do those things, to be successful, to be free, to be prosperous, Look around, look around at the world. It's Western societies. It's the Anglosphere and a portion of Europe. Okay, why is that? Is it possible that that's something to do with their values? Okay, well, which of those values do we need to preserve and celebrate? That's, I think, the conversation that we should be having. And it's way bigger than, with all possible respect, John Anderson and Constantine Kissin. People have to get around from different political perspectives and work out what it is that we can agree on that can offer people that meaning and purpose. And then we can say to them, this is what we believe in, come and join the team. Now, the last time we talked, I was particularly keen to get your views on, on why Russians supported their president uh, in the special military operation. Some Don't call it war, otherwise you'll get arrested in Russia and put into prison for 10 years. Yeah, uh, you know, why they supported him uh, in that spe special military operation, as he calls it. Uh, and your insights were very valuable uh, and the conversation, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people tuned into that. How do you see it? Uh, how has your thinking about it evolved? Somebody said to me the other day, I can't see an exit plan. 
Mm. How are you seeing it? Well, I've said from literally day one that the likely outcome, and this, there are a lot of people understandably in Ukraine who are not necessarily that happy about me saying it this way, even though I've obviously been a big supporter of their cause. Uh, and likewise, there are lots of people in Russia who wouldn't be happy hearing this either. Uh, look, what Ukraine needs is to make sure this never happens again, right? Because it's not it, just Ukraine, I suggest. But of course, of course. Mm. Uh, but from a Ukrainian perspective, particularly, my view is what they need to do is you got to remember this isn't the, 2022 wasn't the beginning of this process. Yeah. This started in 2014 when Russia bit off chunks of Ukraine. No repercussions came. Ukraine wasn't given long-term security in the way that it needed. And so it happened again. And if the war ends somehow without Ukraine having long-term security, this will happen again in the future. So the number one goal for Ukraine, in my opinion, there'll be people who disagree, but this is my opinion, and I've said this from the beginning, is not actually to preserve every tiny bit of land. That isn't the end goal, in my opinion. A much better outcome for Ukraine would be long-term security. There are only two ways to do that. NATO membership or UN peacekeeping force on the border. I don't see UN peacekeepers there, personally. I mean, it may happen, but unlikely. So that means one thing, one thing only. Ukraine needs NATO membership. Now, on the other hand, what do you have to do to get there with minimum casualties? Because Ukraine is losing a lot of its people. Uh, and a lot of its economic base is being destroyed, uh, even though they are fighting extremely well and courageously, and I have huge admiration for them. Uh, the, the solution would be, in my view, likely that Russia gets to keep Crimea and pieces of the Donbass. NATO accepts Ukraine, and this essentially ends that standoff because Russia is not going to invade NATO and Ukraine becomes NATO. So that's the end goal. Obviously, Putin isn't going to be happy with Ukraine joining NATO, given that the very reason he claims to have started this war is to prevent Ukraine becoming uh, a hostile NATO t force on its border. Uh, but if Ukrainians can, can continue to give Russia a bloody nose, which is what I've said from the beginning, that will be, in my opinion, the most likely outcome. Uh, as for where we are now, we're sitting here on the 9th of May, uh, Victory Day, as, as we call it in Russia and Ukraine. Um, the Ukrainians are about to mount a counteroffensive. Uh, that counteroffensive, no one knows the outcome of how that will go. Uh, what has happened so far is Russia has lost a huge number of men, uh, in, wounded and killed in this war. So is Ukraine, probably not as many. Uh, and th this has been a serious blow to Russia's military, clearly, uh, and the reputation of its military as well. Uh, and so in terms of the, the end goal, I think we, we have to wait and see how the, how the, how the counteroffensive plays out and where that takes us, frankly. It depends what happens uh, and then the response from, from both sides. Well, that's a very valuable set of insights. To round this out, you're now a dad. You're obviously enjoying it immensely. It gives you great drive to try and make sure he's got a secure future. What's it prioritizing in your mind in terms of trying to ensure that he can enjoy a secure and good life? Uh, look, I think we, we talk a lot about societal issues and they are very important. But the, the more I go through this uh, journey of my life, the more I realize how the personal is important. Uh, so the number one goal for me is to be the best man that I can be. Um, I think that is the best guarantee of my son having a good life. Uh, me being uh, the best husband, the best father, um, in terms of, you know, to the extent that I am a public figure, being the best version of that that I can be, to try and bring people over, to let go of my natural tendency to enjoy irritating people and taking the piss and whatever. Look, these are part of life, but I'm trying to be more responsible. I hope I am being more responsible with the way that I communicate. So for me, first and foremost, you have to start the change within yourself. Um, and then in terms of society, look, I, I stand for the, the things that I've always stood for. You know, I believe the, the West is great. I believe it's worth preserving. I believe that we are in a good place still, but we are moving in the wrong direction. We are moving in the wrong direction. And uh, 
you know, maybe my son is, is, you know, he's come along at a time when he'll have a good life still. But, you know, is Western civilization in a terminal decline? I mean, it remains to be seen. And it also depends on what people do. I mean, there, there, is, um, there is always the hope that we can change the direction of travel. Um, whether that's accurate or not, I think remains to be seen. So look, the, the thing I've realized more than anything is I've let go of the attachment to you know, societal outcomes because I know that I can't change them. I can't. I, I can do my best. I can sh shape 0.0001% of the conversation that happens in this area, and I'm, I'm doing my best. But it, it, that's really all that anyone can do, isn't it? I mean, maybe, maybe you can... Look, you, you, you were deputy prime minister of a country, so y you've had more impact directly in that way. But even so, I don't imagine you feel like you, you were able to you know, revolutionize Australia in, in the image that John Anderson would want it to be or to change Western society. We can't. We're just... We're, 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 we're small people, all of us, trying to do our best. And I think uh, for my son, the best thing I can be is just a, a good example if, if, I, if I can try to be that. Well, I think that's a, a noble aspiration. And I'd only say... And that's all that it is, an aspiration. <laughs> no, I was going to say, don't sell yourself short. Uh, I think uh, you do great things. And thank you very much for your time indeed. Thanks for having me back. Mm -hmm.